Hey everyone, welcome to Rote Reviews. I'm Ben Sebastian here with my co-host, S.A. Baz Collins, who's over there waving because he loves this film. <laughs> we are here today to introduce you to Edge of 17, an older film uh, produced in the 90s. The write-up is specifically a teenager copes with his sexuality on the last day of school in 1984. It shows him coping with being gay and being with friends. And it is. If you came of age in the 80s or 90s, this is a big bucket of nostalgia with cute fuzzy butts, more so than I was expecting for that era. I was a little shocked. And short question. shorts, which are making a comeback. <laughs> right. If, however, you did not come of age in the 80s or 90s and you are younger than that, but you use the phrase daddy or yes, daddy, you need to watch this for some empathy because this is what your elders went through. This yes. was an era where even families practiced a bit of don't ask, don't tell. And it comes out in this film when his family finds out he's gay and his parents can't talk about it, but they still obviously love him. Yes. And what's interesting about this film, the reason why I chose it is because in the past, whenever we've done coming out stories and coming of age stories, one of the things Vance usually says is, I, oh, I liked it or some version of that. And then he'll say, but it's not my experience in the Midwest. Ha ha. I gave him a movie that was in the Midwest. <laughs> it's true. As a matter of fact, the main character in one shot is actually wearing a shirt from Wisconsin oil. <laughs> <I'm> state pride. <laughs> Not that I'm proud of our oil company, but. <laughs> or your politics there. <laughs> no. Uh, the film actually takes place in Ohio, in yes. Sandusky, where Cedar Point Amusement Park is. They actually use the amusement park for one shot, and it's hilarious because there's a roller coaster in the 90s that didn't exist in the 80s that is yeah. predominantly shown. <laughs> right. Um, um, it's also the trivia, and as much of the filming took place in Ohio, in Sandusky, Ohio, with the amusement park scenes filmed in Sandusky Cedar Point, as you said, the amusement park that we, where the writer actually worked when he yes. was in high school. So it has, it is an air of almost autobiographical in nature for the writer. It's almost like he's he wrote his history into this story, obviously with mm -hmm. characters and influences he had during that period. Um, and one of the things I love about it is that it is a clear example of the family we make. Yes, it's very, it's one of the be much. one of the best examples I've ever seen. Uh, can I just tell you, one of the reviews of this movie, one of the official reviews back in the day when it came out in '98, um, was from Roger Ebert, whose criticism was, "Well, if that character Eric could just be a better conversationalist." I'm like, what do you do with that? That's how it was written. He's acquitting himself of what he has in front of him in the script. <laughs> I'm like, what an odd freaking review that was. Yeah, it's tough for a teenager caught in that situation to be a good conversationalist. Right. The, that, the whole purpose of teenagehood is awkwardness. Right. Which is why yeah. every teenager line in the world is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I kind of got, got over the gasping a little bit. Right. Um, so main character is Eric, has a very warm and loving family. Uh, to the end, they still love him. They just don't know how to deal with it. Uh, his best friend Maggie is obviously the, the girl who loves him. And when he comes out to her, it shatters her heart. And she tries to be a friend and things go south. His first love interest is a guy named Rod, who is older, meets him at the amusement park. And you kind of get the feeling that there's something funky going on there and I'm not going to spoil it. Um, but Eric falls hard like a teenager would with his mm -hmm. first love mm -hmm. and falls really hard. Meanwhile, his mm -hmm. manager at the amusement park played by Leah Delaria character named Angie sort of ushers this new little baby gay into the world of what being gay and queer meant in 1984. And, and you can definitely tell the mother aspect when she says, be careful out there, little man. Yep. Um, yeah. And she remains throughout the film a source of protection and guidance for him yeah. um, in a very warm way. In many way. ways, she's his rock. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the one other thing I'll say about her character is stay through the credits because she has yes. a bit after the credits that yes. will crack you up. And if you and it, what's really interesting, it definitely for me, it was the gay version of the Ferris Bueller moment. You know, yeah. it just it, it's just, you it know, really it was. was it was a nice touch at the end. Um, mm -hmm. And I've always liked Leia Delaria. I think she's immensely talented and doesn't get half the due that she deserves. Right. Um, I just I I have always loved her. Um, and just 
you know, that she gets to shine in this movie. It, she, she's kind of like in this film for me, and I know we're already getting into the review, sorry. But um, for me, I, I'm just going to toot Leia Delaria's horn right now. Um, so she's not here with us. Leia, Leia. No. Come, come talk to us. Uh, yeah, exactly. We would love to talk to you, lady. Um, but uh, sh the thing is with her is that I loved that she has a way of doing the mother hen without making it be mother hen. Yeah, she's not that, a smother that, mother. She's right. not a smother mother. She's a exactly. put you in the world mother. Right, right. And she wants you to experience what you need to experience. But she also keeps a careful eye on you in case you start to flounder, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that I love about her is that and her character is that Leia's really good at that divining line. Can we just talk a little bit for a second about her her uh, interpretation of blue skies? That's probably one of the best versions I've heard. It really is. She and she is so spot on with that interpretation of that song. Mm -hmm. um, it just. It, it blew my mind when I remembered seeing it in the theater. Um, I was just like, wow, this this lady, this lady just knocks my socks off. Um, mm -hmm. And her comedic timing is impeccable. You know, um, you know, she's she's just really a treasure uh, in the queer community. And like I said, I don't think she gets half the due that she deserves. Right. Um, you know, she's a marvelous porn. She's in Orange is the New Black, which is where people might know of her now. Right, yeah. But she did have a career. That's weird. This thing is looking kind of strange. Um, she, she did have a career um, in uh, you know, before that, that, you know, she's appeared in a lot. Of, and it's also interesting. Stephanie McVeigh, who plays Eric's mother, she's done a lot of work with Todd Stevens, the writer of this. So she's a staunch ally of queer movies. There are several yeah. queer movies that he produced and has done and has directed. And, she, and in fact, she's in the much anticipated Swan Song, which is coming out you know, sometime this year. They don't have a date and that's really irritating because I keep looking, keep looking, keep looking now that we can go back to theaters. And she's- kind of, We can kind of go back to theaters. I don't know where that's headed. Yeah, yeah, well, anyways. Um, I don't know if they're going to release it streaming. They should. I, I hope they do. Um, but he, Todd Stevens, the writer, got the gig as the writer and the director of this new movie that's coming out with Udo Kier, who's also a major gay icon in movies. He's a marvelous German, or yeah, I think he's Austrian, um, actor who's if you once you see him you go oh yeah that guy you know you may not know the name but you definitely know who he is he's appeared in a number of major films across his career <laughs> um but yeah so uh, stephanie mcveigh who plays the mother is in that movie and, and as well as many others i just i love her and her dedication to stories from our community um yes. So um, big shout out to her um, that she's in this as well. And I think she plays, at least from my perspective, being a Californian, she's the quintessential what I think a Midwest mother would be like for the most part. E Not my mother. Well, I would say she's the quintessential, yeah. slightly conservative family mother from Ohio. Yes, she fit that stereotype really yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. And which is what the, you kind of get the impression the family is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're supposed to be. It's very Americana. Yep. <laughs> Down to the bologna sandwiches with ketchup and white bread. <laughs> I know. I did the same thing too in the theater. I'm like, what's that? Oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, yeah. You want another Midwest recipe? Fry the bologna first. Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> We, we used to, be, uh, this is a total side thing, but while we're on the bologna and the fried bologna, we used to- While well, you're on the bologna? Yeah, we, did, we didn't We didn't. actually call it a fried bologna. We all, as kids, we always called it bologna on fire. <laughs> nice. Which is, I think, how you should market that if you're ever going to make it a sandwich, bologna on fire. <laughs> Hit it with some chiracha or whatever, anyways. <laughs> I promise I will never make that sandwich. <laughs> All right, let's, you're going to go first. What are your review numbers? My review numbers are, uh, for me, it's, it's, they're almost five all across the board. Um, the only thing that I, and I kind of agree with some of the, I went back and looked at a lot of the reviews, the professional reviews, and there was one thing that one 
um, reviewer said that there were times when it felt like it was a stop start mo- momentum in the story. Mm-hmm. So that one I'm going to give a 4.5, but for me, the rest of them are all fives across the board, and my personal one is a five. Um, I, I, I hadn't really noticed it when I first saw it in the theaters, but upon reading that review and then looking at it again, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that beat should have been better. And, you know, so there were there were moments where it really did feel like momentum, 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 slam, mm-hmm. momentum, momentum, momentum. So and it didn't happen all the time, but there was a stop start kind of feel to it. Um, and it was one of Todd Stevens first, you know, forays into, you know, indie filmmaking. So, I, you know, I get it. And, I, and that's really the, on the director, not Todd, the writer. But, you know, mm-hmm. so. Right. Well, then I get to be Captain Harshpants again. Oh, okay. Not in a bad way. I'm I'm giving numbers for modern audiences looking back at a film from decades ago because I want you to go into it not expecting today's glitz and glam and not expecting today's lighting or today's cameras. So overall production, I did give it a 3.5 because they're working with equipment from the mid-90s. Well, um, yeah, but it was apropos for that period. It was. And so it historically it a, accurate. It gives it a historic feel, but don't go into it expecting the clean lines of today's comedies script screenplay i also give it a 3.5 because of the start stop stuff i think that originated in the script but i'm going to knock the director for it too in a minute um because there were a couple moments where i actually felt it was dragging like stuff came to a stop and they were doing some really dramatic things with those looks but i was like come on get get to the story i want to what happens next? And I know that's because I'm a modern but, but, watcher. Uh, oh, my counter, just, and I know we're, I'm interrupting your ratings, but and I'm sorry about that, but I, I will counter in that. Uh, in those moments, I think it was to highlight the awkwardness of Eric discovering himself. And, you know, there's one scene that actually totally blew my mind. I watched it again last night, just before we did this review. And it, it was the scene where Eric goes to a, party on typical midwest kids mm-hmm. party mm-hmm. and then he gets up and he starts to dance mm-hmm. and you see him start to blossom and the whole gay arm movement starts happening mm-hmm. and i really felt like he was a butterfly in a room full of cockroaches yep yeah. oh yeah that came through that's just it about half of those needed to be kept the other half were really not they were just time fillers um, where am I? Sound lighting score. I actually gave that a 4.5 because that hit all the right music notes for me. Like all of the song choices were one nostalgic, but two absolutely appropriate for what was going on on the screen. Mm-hmm. Kudos to that. Art direction costuming. I gave a four. It was accurate. 100% for the time period. Didn't blow my socks off, but it didn't get in the way of a damn thing. I uh, thought it was good because they also did the hair. It yeah, was yeah. done very, very yes, it 80s. Was. The makeup looks, you know, the Annie Lennox, you know, yeah. when he, when Eric started exploring that, you really saw the Annie Lennox in, you yeah. know, inference. And, and I love the class system, you know, where uh, when he had that discussion with uh, the one guy who said, you know, he liked Madonna more mm. than Annie Lennox. And there was that class system. And that shit existed then. Yeah, you it know? did. <laughs> I know. You're one of those. Yeah. Uh, where was I? Casting, 4.5. I thought everybody was exactly cast the, for the right part. It, I didn't have any problems with any yeah. of it. Directing, that's where I gave it a four. Like you said, there were points where I was just wanted to take the director's side and say, no, you can skip that. It's okay. We don't need that. Mm-hmm. Uh, queer Themes presented four. It is locked in time. Um, the, the struggles that he went through, while similar to today's, are not today's. So I gave it a four because it's historically accurate and enjoyable, but it's not super relevant so personal overall rating of four it's enjoyable i'd watch it again excellent um and i will make sure to post the uh imdb and rotten tomato scores for this when we put it up um and uh yeah i mean it, it, this is one of my favorites um it actually was one of my first date movies with my husband <laughs> so yeah so it, it that and stargate i don't know <laughs> now hey one of the ultimate heroes in stargate was a linguist so that's one of my favorites Do yeah not yeah yeah i know and i love james spader so you know anyways um but yeah it, it was uh it was a really really uh it was an important film for me to see because it was validation of my time in the clubs my time of discovery mm-hmm. um and so for me it hit a lot of personal notes 
um, having gone through it. Like I said, the only difference was this was Midwest, so it was slightly more conservative than what I experienced in California. It mm -hmm. wasn't exactly me. And can we just say, I am surprised an indie film got that many clearances for the music. I mean, I, 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 people need to know in film, mm -hmm. sometimes the budgets are so large if they use somebody else's music, that's where the money goes because those licenses are expensive. Yeah. I don't know if this director or the producer called in some favors from, some of them were queer artists of the 80s, you know, yep. like Bronski Beat. Um, and, but, you know, it was, that that's, I don't know if you could have done that film justice if you did not have the music. So I can see them spending the money on that, but, uh, for the number of songs you get, I mean, you get Missing Persons, you've got, you know, there are all these very famous 80s bands that were in that movie. And it's just like, mm -hmm. that had to have cost some major bucks. You know, I was kind of blown away by that. And when I really thought about it, I was like, wow, mm -hmm. you know, for an indie to have that, this is one of those few times where an indie didn't have to hire a cover band to right. do the music, you know? Right. Um, you know, so it, it, for me, it was well worth it because it musically, it nailed it to the wall. Um, I, I remember every single one of those. And I love people, only people from the 80s might get this, but I love the whole Robbie Neville influence when he's at the record store and he's looking through the records and he crosses over and the guy with a long ponytail goes walking back. I'm like, there's the 90s coming. Yep. <laughs> Yes, it was. <laughs> All the young ones are going to be out there going, who the fuck is Robbie Neville? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyways, um, so that's it for this week, kids. Uh, what are we doing next week? Dealer's Choice, what do you want? Anything mm -hmm. goes. I'm feeling good. So next week, we are going to watch Pride. Um, it is a British film that uh, takes place in the mid-80s. And it is um, actually autobiographical. Um, there are the characters that are reflected, some of the characters reflected in the film actually did exist. They were activists um, during the whole rise of uh, queerdom, actually really politically becoming active because of the AIDS crisis. Um, and it happens to cross with the minor strike that was a big deal in Britain at the time. So there's some really interesting story weaving there. And I think uh, it's a ripe one for us to talk about uh, since we're still in Pride season. So, mm -hmm. so that's what's going to happen next week. So until then, remember to like, subscribe, tell your friends about us, and also comment down below and let us know what movies or TV series we should take a look at that you're interested on our reflection since we do do a thorough knockout of what we think.